Good morning, Capstone. It is such a joy to worship God together as a church, week after week. You know, God is always faithful in our lives. And I want to thank God for, for uh, His consistent grace upon us. Um, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for continuing to sow into the kingdom of God. Those of you who have uh, um, been regular givers to our church, I want to praise God for all of you and those of you who have uh, you know, given, given out sacrificially. Praise God for you. Um, every one of you who have chosen uh, to be part of the missions, I'm sure this weekend you would have received an email from us to, uh, telling you about how do you send the missions. If you did not, uh, maybe you should immediately uh, update us quickly on your email ID so that you get to receive um, how do you send. Uh, you get an email talking about how do you send your missions offering and where do you send this year. Praise God for the opportunity that God gave us as a church um, to be a church that is generous towards others. And I want to thank God for that because of you. This is, uh, uh, you know, this is such a joy to lead a church that loves to serve other people. And of course, this weekend, well, this week, we are going to uh, send out all the tabs that are required for the children, um, you know, whom we have selected for their education. We would receive it tomorrow, uh, the tabs that, are, that we are going to send out. And I'm sure it will be a blessing uh, to all those children. And they will always be grateful to every one of you who have chosen to give into the kingdom of God. We had such a wonderful anniversary, our 13th anniversary. And uh, we am sure you had some recap of that on our update section. And, um, and some of those memories will keep in our mind, you know in our hearts each year as it passes by. Every, uh, every time we see some of those things, as we look back, we will look at God's faithfulness in our lives and His mercies that have been new every morning. Uh, so I want to thank God for, for the opportunity that He gave us to celebrate our 13th anniversary. All right? So praise God for that. Let me take a moment to pray with you right now before we get into the Word of God and uh, continue our series on the sign. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, um, to worship and, of course, to receive your word that you gave us. Um, and I want to thank you, God, for the works of Jesus here on earth. And each of them teach us so much. And I pray that we would again today learn something very important that is necessary for all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are almost uh, coming to the end of our series called The Sign. We're talking about how um, John lists out seven miracles of Jesus here on earth and calls them the signs. The signs that he talked about are the authentication of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In fact, he says, the reason I'm writing this is so that you may believe in Jesus uh, Jesus as the Son of God, and that you may have eternal life. So we started off talking about how Jesus, uh, the winemaker, um, is the one who is the master of the quality. We're looking at the miracle, we're looking at the master itself, and are learning some very important life lessons, and important lessons about him, his nature, his character towards us. So as the winemaker, you see him as the master of quality, who had come to make all things new. That's what we have learned. Then we looked at Jesus as the space bender, the one who is the master of the distance, how he is able to uh, bend the space by staying at one place and healing at another location. Uh, you can see that um, Jesus always arrives right on time at the right place in order to do the right thing. That's what we have learned in the way he healed the official son. We see him, Jesus, as the clock master, that no matter how much time had passed by the master of the time, uh, that 38 years this person had been lame at the pool of Bethesda, but Jesus comes and heals him an instant. Uh, so it doesn't matter how long you had your problem, Jesus can make all things possible. Nothing is impossible with Jesus. Uh, we saw him as the Lord Algebra, the one who can multiply with nothing, basically. Uh, you saw how is the master of the quantity 
when he fed over 2000 20000 people with five loaves and two fish we saw how even when we did a simple visual demonstration it would have uh, imagine the kind of awe it would have created among the people as they sat down and received uh, this miracle first hand we talked about how no number is too big for god doesn't matter how big your debt is today no number is too big for god and at the same time no number is too small for god so i want you to know that god does care for about ev- care about every single thing that is happening in your life and that's what we learn there is no number that is too big or too small for jesus especially when it comes to your life my life last week the week before our anniversary we talked about how jesus as the water walker teaches us shows us that he is the master of the elements now there is if there is one thing that we can nev- never control that is the elements that are around us but the creation obeys jesus it bends to its master elements bend to his master and we saw how um this this amazing miracle of jesus walking on the water uh, shows us more than peter walking on the water it talks about how jesus sees everything that is happening in our lives the one who sees the elroy the one who sees your struggles right now wherever you are god does see every single struggle that you're going through at this point of time and he comes for you even if it means him walking on the water and coming to you he will do that just because he sees your struggles uh when you think nobody's watching you so that's uh, that's what we have learned so far today we will look at the sixth miracle um the sixth sign that john talks about now before i talk about the sixth sign itself the mass the miracle itself let me just set a context for you um the primarily when you look at gospels you will see that jesus did four types of healing miracles um he healed um the lame he made the lame walk he then he made mute speak uh, of course he made the deaf hear and he healed the blind people so the blind people were able to see gave them the vision when i looked at the gospels you will find as you compare do a comparative study of jesus healing the blind people make them see um there are three very specific incidents that talked about jesus healing a blind person now jesus healed many blind people but in the scriptures you see three very specific incidents mentioned all through the gospels all four gospels when you do a comparative study now uh, each incident we know uh, happened at one particular place the first one that you see is an incident that took place in the city of jericho the near the city of jericho, jericho. mark talks about it in mark chapter 10 where mark mentions there's a guy called bartimius who has been blind was you know he's blind and he's begging on the street sees jesus coming and asks jesus to uh, heal him that's one incident where jesus healed a blind man then you see another incident where jesus healed another guy at the pool of bethesda again um at the pool of bethesda jesus sees a blind man who comes to him and asks him for healing jesus lays his hand over him and in fact brings healing uh, to him that's what you'd see a second incident uh, and uh, on both these incidents mark talks about them there being only one blind man while matthew says there are two uh, at both places it doesn't matter if it's one blind one person or two blind people but the incidents happened exactly at jericho uh, one at jericho and one at Uh, the pool of bethesda the third one is the one that we see right now uh, in john chapter 9 um in john chapter 9 you see a blind blind born blind man who was healed at the pool of siloe let's go to john chapter 9 verses 1 to 7 i want to read just the that particular incident and then i want to talk about uh, what can we learn from this particular um incident that took place in the life of jesus this narrative John chapter 9 verse 1 As Jesus was walking along he saw a man who had been blind from birth Rabbi his disciples asked him Why was this man born blind Was it because of his own sins or his parents sins It was not because of his sins or his parents sins 
Jesus answered, this happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. Keep that word in your mind. We must quickly carry out the task assigned to us by the one who sent to us, who sent us. The night is coming and uh, then no one can work. But while I'm here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with saliva and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. Now his neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was. Others said, no, he, was, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the same one. Let me pause there. I know I said seven verses, but I, ate, I, I read eight verses. Uh, but here is the miracle, very simple and short. Here is a blind man who was born blind. And Jesus' disciples saw him, asked him a question. Jesus answered their question and then went about healing this blind man. That's the gist of the story. Now, as we already told you, four primary types of healings in the Bible. Uh, these are repeated again and again in the Gospels. Jesus made the lame walk. Jesus made the mute see, uh, sorry, mute speak, uh, the blind see, and of course, he made um, the deaf hear. Now, while all four types of healing miracles um, are amazing by its own right, blindness certainly entails the greatest degree of difficulty simply because of the complexity of human eye. We'll talk a little bit about human eye in a moment. But the sixth miracle itself, the one that we have just read, is in a category by itself. You see, Jesus doesn't heal, just doesn't just heal the blind man. He heals a born blind. And that's a very important observation that you and I need to remember. He says the significance of this is uh, that particular miracle is this, that there are no synaptic connections between the optic nerve and the visual cortex of this blind man's brain. That's a very important thing for us to remember. He's born blind. He has no connections between the optical nerve and the visual cortex in his brain. That's why it's a big miracle. That's why it's very important for us to understand why Jesus very specifically said so that the power of God may be revealed through this miracle, through this person. Now, here is the big lesson that you and I need to learn. Uh, and then I will proceed to talk about something very important about this miracle. Here is the lesson, today's lesson. There is nothing Jesus cannot restore or reverse in your life. There is nothing that Jesus cannot restore or reverse in your life. There are no health issues that Jesus cannot restore back. There are no lost opportunities that Jesus cannot give back. There is no lost financial status that Jesus cannot restore back. There is no spiritual debauchery that Jesus cannot rescue you from. Everything is reversible in the economy of God. He is the Lord of irreversible. We may think things that have happened to you are irreversible. You may think that the state that I am in today, um, uh, I, I, I don't think I can ever be restored back to the former, former glory. I want you to know Jesus can restore everything, can reverse everything. There is nothing Jesus cannot restore or reverse in your life. Keep that in your mind. And I want to build my case as we look at this miracle. Now, the study of God is called theology. Of all the ologies, um, you know, uh, you get to learn, um, uh, um, you know, about God in what we call the theology. By the way, the notes is available on the U version, right on your comment section. You just have to click on the digital notes and you'll get your notes. If you have a U version, uh, you can, you know, go into that app and you will see our notes there. The study of God is called theology. And the theology is primarily based on what we call the scriptures, you know, the word of God. 
Everything that we know about God is specifically revealed in the scriptures. We call this the special revelation. There is a natural revelation that God gave. As we look around the world, we see the nature and we find the glimpses of the creator all across us, around us, all across um, the globe and the universe. Um, well, that is a general revelation, is what we call, and this is a special revelation. The study of God primarily is based on the scriptures itself. Now, but God also revealed himself, as I already told you, uh, different facets of his character uh, through the nature that is around us. So, um, and if you turn a blind eye to the natural revelation, special revelation won't be special. You know? If this has to be a special revelation, then you also need to see how God revealed himself around you. Albert Einstein once said like this, Science without religion is lame. But at the same time, conversely, religion without science is blind. And that's why it's important for us to understand, science plays a very important role for us to understand who our God is. Now, whether you know it, I know it, whether we know it or not, acknowledge it or not, an astronomer who charts the stars, the genesis who um, uh, maps the ge uh, you know, uh, genome, the, the oceanographer who uh, explores the, you know, uh, the barrier reef, or, uh, or the ornithologist who studies the birds in the sky, the rare, preserves the rare, rare, rare bird species, or the physicist who tries to catch the qu uh, you know, quakes and quarks, and, uh, and the chemist who synthesizes the chemical uh, components um, in a pharmaceutical, into a pharmaceutical drugs, which we really need right now, uh, are all indirectly studying the creator by studying his creation. There will always be scientists who will reject the existence of the one who created their curriculum. But just because they keep faith out of equation of the science doesn't necessarily mean we should keep science out of our theology, the equation of faith. Just because scientists are rejecting Bible doesn't mean we should reject science. Science belongs to God. It's the study of God. And that's why I want to take a little bit of uh, a dive into science today so that you understand the power of this miracle. You see, science is a poor substitute to the scripture. Your life cannot be based on science. It has to be based on the scripture. Science is a poor substitute for scripture. But science definitely is a great complement to the scripture. When you read the scripture, you find science. And you can find the glimpses of science all across the scripture. And that's why I said science is a great complement to the scripture itself. So uh, we need to look at science a little bit in order to understand this healing miracle. You see, this healing miracle isn't just as simple as correcting astigmatism or, or, or healing a coronial scar or, or a corneal scar, sorry, <laughs> or, or removing a cataract. Jesus hardwires this blind man's brain by creating a synaptic pathway that never existed. And that's what we're going to talk about. It's nothing short of synoptic, synoptogenesis. Now, in order to explain that to you, I need, you I, I need to illustrate that to you so that you, you understand. As, as, as we look at the medical science, especially the science of how our eye works and our eye is created, uh, we, we get to learn something very important from this particular miracle. As you see on your screen, uh, it's just a simple illustration on how the eye works. Let me take a few moments to talk about that today. You know, on the day 42 after the conception, the first neuron is formed in a baby's brain. Day 42, remember that. Day 42 after the conception, the first neuron, the first brain cell, the neuron that makes up the brain cell actually forms in child's brain. At birth, once a child 
comes out of the womb of a mother, at birth, the baby will have had an estimated 86 billion brain cells. Day 42, he's got the first brain cell. She's got a first brain cell, whichever. And the day she comes out, or he comes out of the womb, he's got 86 billion brain cells that make up his brain, her brain. As the newborn baby experiences new sights and sounds, and you know, the, the brain begins to form, uh, form a neuronal connections, which are called synapses. So, uh, neural connections to different parts of the body, which then bring the news back, the knowledge back into the brain. Those are called synapses, the neural connections between the brain cells and the body parts. Now these, you know, these, these synapses crisscross the brain like a, like a telephone wires that, that crisscross uh, across the city, you know, hundreds and millions of them. By the time baby is just six months old, each brain cell, each brain cell has at least 18,000 neuronal connections to, its, to itself. You know, 86 billion brain cells makes a brain and each of those brain cells has minimum of 18,000 neuronal connections, synapses. By the time a baby is fully grown, fully um, healthy, um, they say it reaches up to 17 million connections to each brain cell. That's a staggeringly phenomenal number in, in such a small brain of ours. So many neural connections. We call them synapses, by the way. So as the baby is growing, as he's taking the information in, the connections between the brain and the other parts of the body begin to happen. They have to develop. The more they have the connections, the smarter the brain becomes. At just about six months old, the children begin to develop internal pictures of external realities. Psychologists call this particular ability of human beings as, the, um, as, as, um, as a representational intelligence. Meaning whatever we see externally has some kind of meaning in our brain. So like this apple, the color of this apple, the shape of this apple, uh, the look of it, all this, as it falls into our eye, sends signals through its optic nerve, connects to the visual, visual cortex through what we call the neurons, which we call the synapses, sends this information into visual cortex, where the visual cortex is actually storing all this information. The external reality has some kind of representational intelligence taking place inside the visual cortex. So basically, our, our visual cortex is the dictionary of everything that we see around, everything that we perceive. Now, it's like a slow developing Polaroid picture. Um, you know Polaroid pictures, right? Which develop into one, they take time, they slowly develop. So as, um, as the child begins to take all the external realities, into our eye, the, those things slowly develop into a proper representational image in visual cortex. Now, um, the first internal image would be mom, um, you know, which develops at about six months of, 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 of uh, age. Dads, you know that we don't even come into the picture till eight months, so it doesn't matter how much you make faces, she doesn't even recognize you. Thank God I didn't know about that before when I was a kid, when, when I was taking care of my kids, not when I was a kid, when I was taking my kids. Um, but give, given a child few years, as they begin to develop this, this ability to uh, you know, have this representational intelligence, their entire vocabulary would match a picture. So if eyesight doesn't develop normally, then this visual cortex doesn't develop normally. If the eyesight is, if the eye is not taking the images well properly, then there is no representational intelligence inside the visual cortex. Basically, visual cortex would become a blank 
if the eyes are not working. Now keep that in your mind. That simply means this. Thus, that if words don't prompt images, that means we have never seen that image. For example, if I say red fort, for every single Indian, the image that comes into our head is the Rashtrapati Bhavan on the August 15th or 26th of January or any time Rashtrapati comes onto the power or something like that. If I say, same thing will happen if I say a lake or if I say a car, if I say a pet. Now, our mind may fill in those blanks with different images. For example, if you say car, the one thing that comes into my head would be XUV 500 because that's the, that's the car I like, that's the car I have. If I say pet, the image that I probably would get is, is, uh, is pug, of course. I have two pugs at home. For some of you, it may be pig. I don't know, but I'm just saying. Uh, it could be anything. You know? Each of us will fill in those blanks with different images because we have identified associated words with certain kind of images. A man born blind can only have an image that his visual cortex can understand. The thing is this, he has zero images in his brain. His photo album is empty, pictureless existence. He couldn't, I know, I, I'm sure he couldn't picture the faces of his mother or father. I, I, you know, he, he, he heard of his friends, De describe the beauty of uh, what is around the lily of Sharon, the, the walls of Jer uh, the beauty of the temple of uh, Solomon in Jerusalem, or how the sunset would look like in the Mediterranean Sea. He would have heard the descriptions of it, but he has nothing to represent what is being, what is being heard into an image, into a picture. He couldn't imagine them because he doesn't have anything in his brain. His Dictionary, Pictionary is empty. I, you know, he, he, had, he had never seen himself in, in, in mirror. Even if he sees himself in a mirror, of course he can't see, but if he does see, he just simply cannot have an image of himself. He, does, he doesn't even know who, who that is in the mirror. He has no self-image. Literally no self-image. Uh, imagine closing your eyes. Even as I'm speaking, imagine closing your eyes and think, uh, think, think this. I imagine that you put a plaster over your eyes and stayed like that for a day, two, three, five days, ten days, I don't know. Never being open, able to open again. You see, your world would go dark. Of course, your world would go dark. But darkness in your, in your own mind can still develop pictures of what you have seen before. You remember the guy at uh, Pula Bethesda, the blind man, when Jesus touched his eyes and asked him, go and clean yourself at the Bethesda. Before he did that, he asked him, do you see? And this man says, I see people as trees. He had some kind of representational intelligence that tells us this boy or this man has never been born blind. He must have developed some kind of blindness um, through some kind of disease over the years. And so, um, you, know, you understand what I'm trying to talk about right now. So he can, at least he had some kind of images in his head. Some of us who are now little blind know what I'm talking about. Not me. But this boys, this born blind guys, eyes have never been opened to begin with. His mind would draw blank. This was the only world this man was born into darkness all around him. Being blind is the only thing he has always known. So humanly speaking, being born blind is a state nobody can solve or correct. At birth, a child's vision is uh, 
is no better than 20 by 200. You know, we call the 2020 vision as a perfect vision. The kids vision is about 20 by 200. They cannot focus on anything beyond 12 inches. That's why touch is critical at the early stage of development of a child. Um, that's how they interpret their world, by touch. After eight months, however, you know, the, their visual acuity, the color, uh, vision, the depth perception, uh, um, you know, uh, rival that of every one of us, you know, this, you know, those of us who make silly faces at them. Um, during this developmental process, the windows of opportunity open and close like a clockwork. The windows of opportunity of developing a healthy vision open and close like a clockwork. Vision, for example, primarily is, uh, is, um, is wired between birth and 18 months. So from my eyeball, the retina that is connected to the optical nerve begins to develop neurons that make the synapses to the visual cortex between birth to 18 months. During this period, whatever I see will start if, as they reflect on the cones inside my retina, if they don't, if my cones are not properly done, de developed, then the images that I see would start getting distorted, the colors would start getting distorted, and that's the information that goes into my, uh, my uh, optical nerve connected to the brain, and then the synapses that is developing between my neuro neurons and brain cells is, uh, is distorted. Wrong information is going on. And, um, you know, um, we really don't have correct understanding of what we are seeing. And that's why this is very important during that uh, birth and first 18 months. Synaptogenesis is the visual cortex. Um, in the visual cortex, peaks at three months old and then develops to 18 months. So this is where the miracle gets more fascinating to us. If you were to place an eye patch over the eye of a born, born, born child, one eye, and keep it like that for more than 18 months, the baby would be blind in one, one eye for their, for, 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 for their entire lifetime. Now, that doesn't mean they've got a problem in eye. The eye is perfect. The optical nerve is perfect. The thing is, there are no neuronal connections that took place because of the eye patch that was kept on their eye. And that's very important for you to remember. Remember this, I'll come to this point a little later. Without any physical deformity or genetic defect, the baby still cannot see for the entire life if that eye patch was there for the first 18 months. That means the 18 months are the window of opportunity that they just cannot miss in order to develop their vision. If there is no synapses between visual cortex and the optical nerve are developed, then there is no vision. One eye, both eyes. So let's double back to the born blind. It simply means this, his condition what uh, is irreversible according to any ophthalmologist. The natural window of developing a synapsis is closed. But that's when God performs his best miracles. When the natural window of opportunities are closed. When humanly speaking, it's a condition, it's a state that is irreversible. That's when God enters into the picture and changes the whole thing. Well, that's how Jesus entered into the blind man's life. Childbearing years were passed by Sarah by many moons, many years before Isaac was born. That doesn't keep God from uh, in a opening a supernatural window of opportunity for Sarah and Abraham. That didn't keep God from opening the womb of Elizabeth and blessing Zechariah uh, um, uh, from having a, uh, having a child, John the Baptist. Doesn't stop Jesus, that doesn't stop God from opening a womb of a virgin. Natural windows of opportunities may have been closed on you, 
I don't know what kind of window of opportunity is closed upon you. Have you ever felt like, that was my option. That was my one opportunity. That was my window of opportunity. I just lost it. Have you ever felt that? I did. And I'm sure many of you did do feel that sense of de you know, depressed feeling of, oh my God, I just lost it. Just by a whisk, window of opportunity. Maybe you have lost the count of how many specialists you have gone in your life or the treatments that you have taken or, or you, you, how your last marriage ended up in a divorce and uh, you know, you're not really sure if you can love somebody else now. It's, uh, I, I, you don't, let alone trust them. I, you, you know, or, or repeated mistakes that seem to have been sabotaged, whatever integrity you've had. Or a social stigma especially in a country like ours, that ostracized your friends and your family, you from your friends and your family. Or maybe you're sexually broken, abused physically, or you don't even know what's your sexuality anymore, and you're kind of confused. You're living in a confused world. Those aren't hypotheticals, by the way. These are the very people Jesus healed. Everywhere in the gospel. The woman with the issue of blood, the woman at the well, the tax collector, the leper, the woman caught in act of adultery, and the list can go on. I want you to know this. I don't know what specific circumstances you're facing today. I don't know that, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, you know how you feel at this point of time, but I do know this, that God can recreate a new synaptic neuronal connections between your optic nerve and your visual cortex. Create a pathway in the old brain. He's the God of second chances. He's the God of third chances. He's the God of fourth chances. He's the God of thousand chances. It doesn't matter which number you are in today, He still can restore, He can still reverse everything. It's never too little, it's never too late. You see, when Jesus gets involved, don't ever say never. Never say never to Jesus. You see, here, is the, here are the three things that you need to remember. There is no unrestorable thing in your life. The connection between optical nerve and the visual cortex for this blind man is an irreversible condition according to everybody. But there he is Jesus. He connected everything back. This boy can recognize everybody. Look at the conversation he had with his parents, with, his, with the Pharisees and Sadducees, with the rest of the people around him. The conversation that he has looks more like he can recognize everybody. How did he do that? What was irreversible? Jesus reversed it. There are no irreversible opportunities. You know, 18 months... The first 18 months were crucial windows of opportunity. From a, from a human perspective, we think that opportunity is lost. But Jesus reversed that. So there are no irreversible opportunities in your life. There are no, in other words, there are no lost opportunities in your life. You see, um, he might have thought you might have thought that um, my window of opportunity is lost and I don't know whether I can come back to that. But there are no irreversible opportunities. There are no unrestorable things. There are no irreversible opportunities. There are no unrestorable states. He lost his vision. He never had a vision. Jesus gave the vision. For this guy, it's a new state being blind and now being able to see, gaining vision. But the guy at Bartimaeus, you know, Jericho, the Bartimaeus, he lost, but he got. Or the blind man at Bethesda lost, but restored. I don't know what you lost. You lost your family, lost your finances, lost your job. 
lost your spiritual um, thirst for God? I don't know what you lost. And you feel like this is, this is not the state you want to be in, but you are in. You feel like you can never get back the state that you were in once. I want you to know there are no unrestorable states. Everything can be restored if you come to Jesus. That's why he introduces himself, the master introduces himself as the light of the world. As long as the light of the world is in this, the darkness will not reign. He says that. Even before he healed the born blind. You see, as we look at the master, here is, here is something that you and I need to... You remember the, 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 the eye patch thing that I talked about? You see, the reason when you put an eye patch over an eye... Can you just put it back? The, the reason... You don't develop neural and connections to the visual cortex. If you put an eye patch over it, um, over your eye, uh, is because the, 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 this image is never getting into your eye. But how does this image get into your eye? How does the color, how does the shape, the, the distance, the depth perception, how does it develop? It can only develop as long as there is light on it. The more the light on the object, and the more light on your eye, the more the vision develops. And that's why when you put a patch on your eye, even if it's physically not deformed, but perfectly right eye, but as long as the light does not penetrate, your world is always dark. That's why it's important for us to see the master as the light of your life. You see, without light, we cannot develop vision. Without Jesus, we can never find freedom. He is the light of our life. John understood that as he watched this miracle take place right in front of his eyes as, as it is being unfolded. The beauty of, of what Jesus is doing, the creator God, as he restored an eyeball, as he restored uh, 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 neuronal connections between the brain, brain cells uh, at, at visual cortex to his optic nerve, as he restored it, even, even though he may not have actually seen that happening, he saw that happening. And he understood, what does it really mean when Jesus says, I am the light of the world? He talks about it in 1 John. In 1 John um, chapter 1 and chapter 2, John does describe Jesus as the light of the world. John 1 verses 5, he says this, this is the message we have heard from Jesus. And now declare to you, what is this? God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. He goes on to explore that thought even in chapter 2. In chapter 2 verses 9, he talks about what this light can... If anyone claims I'm living in the light but hates his Christian brother or sister, that person is still living in darkness. No, Basically, in other words, he say, no one who knows Jesus cannot say, I hate others. Because they would still be living in darkness. Anyone who loves another brother or sister is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates one, uh, another brother or sister is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by darkness. So here, here are the two passages that we just looked at. John describing what happens in a world where there is no light. What happens in a life when there is no light? Trying to tell us, you are living in darkness. You may know Jesus, but if you have not experienced the light shining into your life, you are still in darkness. You, you are not just physically disabled, you are emotionally disabled, spiritually disabled, existentially disabled. When Jesus shined his light into this boy's life, this born blind man's life. He changed everything. His entire existence is changed. You see, first of all, he restored his physical disability. 
That's what we see in John chapter, John chapter 9, verse 7. Jesus, the first thing he did is restore his eyesight back, physical eyesight back. By connecting the you know, visual cortex with the, uh, with, the, with the optical nerve and creating a new neuronal connection, completely neuronal. Giving him a representational intelligence, you know, just simply putting a new dictionary in his brain. Physical disability, he changed it. Not only he did that, later on, as we read in chapter 9, you would see that Jesus finds him at another location where this man uh, you know, stood up for his convictions and talked to Pharisees and Sadducees on how Jesus had delivered him. Jesus, as he spoke to him later on, when everybody outcasted him, Jesus finds him again and begins to have a conversation with him. I love that conversation. Look at what Jesus is doing now. First, he delivered him of his physical disability. Now, he's delivering him of his spiritual disability. Look at it. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found, verses 35, chapter 9, uh, he found the man and asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, Who is he? So that I may believe. I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus. Says, I am speaking to you. Do you believe in the Son of God? Do you believe in the Messiah? He says, I don't know who is the Messiah. If I can see him, if I see the Son of God, I would have to believe in him. I want to believe in him. He didn't say, I may believe in him. If I see the Son of God, I will believe in him. Then Jesus reveals himself as the Son of God. He says, the one you are looking at right now is he. If anybody tells you Jesus did not call himself as a God in the Bible, show them this verse. Virtually, um, you know, literally, I don't know, virtually, literally, Jesus is claiming to be a God. Immediately he says, Yes, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. You saw the spiritual deliverance. You saw how Jesus took away his spiritual disability. But there is something else Jesus did do for this man. He delivered him of his existential disability. It took place right in chapter, uh, chapter, chapter 9 verses 7, right in the beginning itself. You know, sometimes we may overlook what had happened there. Because we focus on Jesus spitting on the ground and making the mud more and, and, and forgetting what he did later on. Now, how, why Jesus did spit on the mud and, uh, and you know, uh, made, made whatever he did, uh, we'll talk about it later. It's not really right now my topic of contention. But what happened later is, is very important for me. Well, he probably did that in order to show how he is the real creator. You remember, from dust, God created man. So he used the same dust to create a new eyeball. I don't know. I'm just saying that. Could be possible. Let's not worry about the theological implications of that part. But let's look at the, what happened. After he applied the mud on his face, he tells this guy an incredible thing. He tells him, I want you to go to the pool of Siloam and clean your face. He didn't ask his disciples to take him. He didn't ask anybody to help him. He told him a direct command, go clean yourself in the pool of Siloam. Mind you, this boy is not at healed. Mind you, he has to go on his own. He's always been a person who's dependent on others. I'm sure from his childhood, people had brought him all the way to the entrance of this temple and made him sit down there at, at this pool, made him sit down there and beg for his money. Because that's what he was doing. You remember? Verses 8, people looked at him and thought, this is a regular beggar. He's been begging here all the time. So he's a regular there, beggar. All his life, he, depended on, he was dependent on somebody else. Somebody else is giving alms to him. Somebody else taking him there and taking him back home, if he had a home. With the way his parents behaved about him, I'd even doubt they really took care of him. I don't know. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. But I'm definitely sure he is in a very, 
in a real existential crisis. His entire life is dependent on somebody else. And Jesus charges him to go on his own. Go to the pool of Siloam. Did you know that um, um, as we go to pool of Siloam now, you would see that it's a, it's a descent of 120 stairs down to the pool of Siloam. This guy had to go on his own to the pool of Siloam and get down 120 stairs before he washed his face. What Jesus, in other words, taught him is that you've been depending on everybody for your existence. Now you don't have to. You don't have to. Your life, if you believe in Jesus and obey what he says, your life is taken care of. Taught him to be on his own. Gave, given him self-respect. You know, there is always a difference between people who depend on others for money, for food, for, for their own existence. The way um, their, their own self-respect is always down. <clears throat> I don't know if you know this. Coming from an orphan, a uh, background of an, being an orphan, I can tell you it's a guarantee that you never develop self-respect. As long as you depend on other people for your existence, you're always going to look down on yourself. But the day... Jesus liberates you from that state and gives you ability and gives you the freedom to depend on God and begin to be used by God. The way you look at yourself is totally changed, entirely changed. For me, it took a long time, but it did took took place. Absolutely from a state of being no self-respect to a place where I'm confident enough that I can do the job that God gave me. Not that I'm overconfident, but I am confident. That's what Paul calls confident hope in Jesus. That's what he did with this man, giving him confidence back in himself. He can do that to you too today. Give you. Even if you miss the windows of opportunity, even if everybody says it's a irreversible, irreversible condition, even if you think it's, you are unrestorable, I want you to know, never say never to Jesus because all things can be reversed. He's the Lord of irreversible. Irreversible listens to the Lord of reversible. Irreversible. So how do you respond? The truth is this. That while we're talking about the born man, born blind man being restored, being given his eyesight back, we can really, I can tell you this, that truth is, many of us can be blind with fully functioning eyesight. Many of us, like Pharisees, like his own parents, like the people who kept saying in verses 8, isn't this the beggar? He's the blind beggar. Isn't the... They were only thinking about his former state, not looking at his present state. Eyesight, fully functioning. Blind completely at what God has done just now. You see, here is, here is the truth. This is, this, is, this is a profound truth. Mark Batterson says this. We don't experience the world as it is. We experience the world as we are. The truth is that, that all around us, whatever is happening, the people we meet, the circumstances that we are experiencing, the world as it is, we don't experience it as it is. We always experience it as we are. Where? Inside. And that's why what John said in 1 John chapter 2 is very important. It's crucial for us to understand. As long as there is darkness in your heart, you never get to see the world as it is. You never get to see God as He is. You never get to see how God is looking at the whole world, His mission. You see, our outer reality eventually becomes a mirror reflection of our inner reality. How we perceive the world around us largely depends on what we have experienced or not experienced. 
what we know and what we do not know. What we expect and what we don't expect. It depends on that. That's why the Pharisees missed the miracle that was right in front of their eyes. Um, I'll give you one experiment and then I'm done. Wherever you are right now at your home, stand up. Uh, unless you really can't stand up, just stand up. And put your hands this way, you know. Can you see this? this is, make a triangle, make a triangle. And focus on an object, anywhere it is. Anywhere the object, any object. Take a fan, round, the round thing about, in your fan, or a light, whatever. You know, just focus on that, right in the middle. Now, the image has to be right in the center of the triangle that your, uh, your, your hands have made. It has to be right in the center. Okay? Now, close one eye. Any eye, close one eye. And keep looking at it in the center. Once you did that, close the other eye. Whichever eye, when you close, the object that is in the center moved, that's called weak eye. So as you look at it, when you close, when I close my right eye, the object moves. That's my weak eye. Never shoot at any target with your right eye. Well, my right eye. If your dominant eye is right, great. If your weak eye is left, don't ever shoot at anything with your weak eye. The problem is, many of us live our lives with our weak eyesight. I think we look at our life, we look at God, we look at our circumstances with our weak eye. See, if you have a critical eye, you will see everything worth being critiqued. If you have a negative mind, negative eye, you will see everybody as a negative person. Everything that's happening in your life as a negative thing. You assume something is wrong with people, something is wrong with the circumstances, something is wrong with God itself. And that's exactly why Pharisees behaved the way they behaved. The thing that they did, they did. They were so focused on the law, they missed the miracle. They couldn't see past the law itself. But the good news, the good news is this. Truth is we are blind, but good news is the light of the world is willing to shine his light on you. Take the darkness away. Well, that's what John learned. That's what John was trying to tell us. That's what you and I need to learn. He's willing to light up your eyes, your life. Now, in order to experience that light, we must believe in Jesus. And we must obey His word. Both things He taught this man. He taught him to believe in Him. He taught him to obey whatever He asked him to do. Believe and obey. Believe and obey. I don't know if you realize this. Almost every single week, that's how I'm concluding. Believe and obey. Believe and obey. The light of the world is ready to shine His light into your life. You must be willing to believe and you must be willing to obey His word. And then, that would birth a miracle in your life. Missed opportunities, lost states, unrestorable mindsets. Everything can be reversed. He can do that to you today. And he's willing to do that. Would you simply see past your weak eye and develop a dominant eye? Begin to look at Jesus in the right way, the light of the world. He learned it, the born blind man. Disciples learned it. And that's why John repeats it. Pharisees couldn't learn so missed. You could be a Pharisee with your eyesight fully functioning, unable to see who Jesus is. Or you could be like this born blind who says, I want to believe. I believe. 
and I will obey and find your eyesight back. I hope that God would do that in your life today. I pray that. Would you just take this moment to close your eyes right now, wherever you are. As our worship team joins us um, in leading worship, I want to pray, and then they would, of course, lead you into a moment of worship, um, worshiping the light of this world who shines his light into our life. So wherever you are, if your family, stand up and hold your hands together, and I want to pray with you this morning that may the light of the world shine into your life. Father, we thank you, God, for this morning. Thank you for speaking to us. It's such a privilege for us to learn from the scriptures and um, realize that we can be blind to what you're doing uh, because um, of our unbelief, because we can't see past um, certain things or because we just simply learn to look at our life with a weak eye. But today, thank you for teaching us. Thank you for teaching us to focus on Jesus, believe in him, and obey him. Find ourselves in the middle of a miracle as he shines his light upon our dark lives. I want to pray with everyone who feel like they have missed opportunities. They have um, unrestorable conditions. They have um, lost certain things in their life that they feel that you can never get them back. They're irreversible. But I know, and we have learned today, we know now that you are the Lord of irreversible. Meaning, you will rever you can reverse everything. Irreversible obeys you. And so we know that you will now restore everything. Restore things, restore lost opportunities, restore um, um, you know, the conditions that we have lost, jobs, relationships, trust, hope, spiritual vigority, whatever we have lost, God. We know that you are a God who gives us second chances, third chances, well, thousand chances, ten thousand chances, as long as we come back. And so we do come back today and ask you, would you please help us? Would you restore it? And by faith, we believe that as we pray together, that you're going to restore our condition, restore our uh, 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 um, physical, emotional, spiritual, anything that anyone is struggling, you're going to reverse that God and show yourself as our creator, as the one who can be believed, trusted and depended upon. Thank you. We bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you take this moment to join our worship team as the leaders into a time of worship?